happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope you're having a good day today. Well, um, I've decided what we're going to talk about today. Um, when I did the episodes about like the secrets our government tried to hide, and then that led me into looking into Bohemian Grove, which I did last week. Uh, there were a few other things that I said I wanted to look into, and so I've made the decision on what that's going to be this week. It may have to be two parts. It just depends on how long it goes into, how, how deep I dig into things. Um, I have found several um, articles and writings and some quotes by a certain person that this is kind of focused a lot around. And I think it's very interesting, especially because this particular person is held up as some kind of hero to the left. The left treat this person as this major hero and uh, made this major push for women's rights. And it's actually pretty disgusting that this is the type of person that they would hold in high esteem. Um, and... Maybe that's because the ones who push this person into that status, like, they know what they are really about and what's behind it, but the people that fall prey to believing it don't really know the whole story. They just know what they're told, and they think it's something great. But if they were to do some digging and just read up on history of these types of people that the left pushes as heroes, they would know that they are nothing of the sort. But before we get started, let's do our daily promise. I felt like I was about, about to go into like an ad read there for a second. But anyway, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James 1.5 no circumstance is too demanding or trivial for God. As believers, we have the ability to gain wisdom from the creator of the universe as we continue through this life. If at any time we need direction or guidance, we can ask God and he will lead us in the ways of righteousness. Um, and I almost feel like that could go along with what we're talking about today, where like, if you're not sure about something, if you just study it and research it, you can gain more wisdom and make a more informed decision. So with that being said, first, we have to talk about the person who started this. And that person would be Margaret Sanger. Hi, and welcome back to my... I didn't mean to do that. Um, Margaret Sanger is a hero to the left. Here's her history of ugly views. This is from CapitalResearchCenter.org. And I have talked about a few things um, about Margaret Sanger, how she is somewhat tied um, to Bill Gates, and she's definitely tied to Planned Parenthood. And she's, I want to say she's also tied to the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds in some way or another in the fact that all of these people, these families, and, and Bill Gates and Margaret Sanger are eugenicists. And just for reference, if you don't know what the, defini what the definition of eugenicist is, let me um, pull up the dictionary definition. And it says, it's an advocate of or a specialist in eugenics, a believer in, advocate of, or specialist regarding the principles of eugenics. Um, so it's a set of beliefs and practices that aim to improve the genetic quality of a human population, historically by excluding people and groups judged to be inferior or promoting those judged to be superior. Well, Margaret, Sa Margaret X. Sanger, ugh, if I could talk today, Margaret Sanger is white, which would lead you to believe that she believes the white race is superior so any black people or hispanic people are inferior and that is exactly what she believed so going back to it <clears throat> margaret sanger she is the woman's rights activist and founder of planned parenthood which we know is the largest abortion provider in america but like i said the left views her as a hero now if there are those 
I don't know if they necessarily view her as a hero because they think a woman has the right to choose or if they view her as a hero because bringing around Planned Parenthood, which offers abortions and the biggest provider of it, black babies are aborted at much higher rates than any other race. Is that why the left views her as a hero? Because they are the actual racist, the Democrats, and they'd be more than happy to see black babies not being born. That's how I would view it, but I can't say what's really in their mind of why they think she's a hero, but I think the left would just think it's great for any baby not to be born, no matter what. They're just a little wicked that way. So it says, and little wonder given her outsized role in the founding and promotion of the modern abortion industry. So that's why she's a hero. But what few people realize is that Planned Parenthood is actually more extreme than its founder, at least when it comes to abortion. In fact, Sanger, as remarkable as it seems, looks positively tame next to the modern agenda. Which raises the question, why would Planned Parenthood, which has gone so far beyond Sanger in its promotion of abortion, eugenics, and population control, still hold her up as a leader of the movement? Isn't she a bit behind the times? Now, I know that Margaret Sanger is dead. We can't go talk to her, but um, supposedly she kind of reversed everything she said on her deathbed. I don't know how true that is. That's just kind of what we've been told. The movement can thank prominent progressive leaders of the last decade for raising Sanger's profile. She's featured prominently in liberal speeches and interviews, like when Hillary Clinton told supporters in 2009 that she was in awe of her. In 2014, Barack Obama became the first sitting president to address the abortion group's national conference, praising Sanger's legacy as its core principle that has guided everything all of you do. Interestingly, Planned Parenthood, whose highest award still bears Sanger's name, has moved so far to the left that its hero probably couldn't even get a job selling t-shirts for the radical abortion giant today. If they were consistent, modern leftists would call Sanger a white supremacist or an extremist for her views on immigration, race, and yes, abortion. You see where I'm going? Take, for example, Sanger's desire to see America's borders sealed to all unfit immigrants to protect what she considered a fragile gene pool. That sounds a lot like the caricature of pro-Trump conservatives conjured up in left-wing fantasies. Then there was her notorious speech before a branch of the New Jersey Ku Klux Klan, a well-documented event despite the content being nearly forgotten. In that speech, Sanger warned that America must keep the doors of immigration closed to genetic undesirables. Then there's Sanger's opinion of non-whites, which, if uttered now, would rightly cause a conniption among Americans. She considered Australia's aborigines compulsive rapists and the lowest known species of the human family, just a step higher than the chimpanzee in brain development. These are Margaret Sanger's words. Please know that. Do not take this out of context and say, I said that. Margaret Sanger said that. Um, because he has no great brain development, Singer wrote, police authority alone prevents aborigines from obtaining sexual satisfaction on the streets. But if Planned Parenthood was honest about its founder, Singer's most unforgivable sin would be her skepticism of abortion itself. One of Singer's few criticisms of the Soviet Union when she visited the communist state in 1934 was its outright insistence on encouraging abortion over contraception. 400,000 abortions a year indicate women do not want to have so many children, a perplexed Sanger told a Soviet doctor. She thought that access to birth control was a human right, but was repulsed by abortion. In my opinion, it is a cruel method of dealing with the problem, Sanger wrote upon returning home, because abortion, no matter how well done, is a terrific nervous strain and an exhausting physical hardship. In fact, the founder of Planned Parenthood was deeply concerned about the tremendous number of abortions taking place in the Soviet Union, as historian Paul Kengor has documented. Legalization of abortion was one of the communist government's first acts following the 1917 Russian Revolution, nearly 60 years before Roe v. Wade accomplished the same thing in America. By 1920, the Soviet Union was providing abortions free of charge to its citizens. Sanger wrote that the number of abortions in Moscow was 100,000 per year. By the 1970s, there were 7 to 8 million abortions annually in the USSR, 
a rate unmatched in human history, Ken Gore points out. Roe v. Wade only managed one and a half million in 1973, the year the Supreme Court legalized abortion. By these metrics, Planned Parenthood's position on abortion in 2020 is far closer to that of post-revolutionary Soviet Union than their hero, Margaret Sanger. If progressives held Sanger to their own standards, they'd have to denounce her antiquity, antiquity, I see, I told you I couldn't talk today, antiquated views. So why do they continue to applaud her? Because the left believes that Sanger's contributions to the pro-choice movement outweigh her racist views. So Planned Parenthood sticks with its despicable founder, refusing to disavow her altogether to its shame. If leftists were honest, they'd renounce Margaret Sanger, then reflect on what it means that they've become even more radical than the eugenicists who started their anti-life movement. But let me go on to say there is a much darker history about being pro-birth uh, control. I will get to that. but. Um, I want to read some things that Margaret Sanger really said about eugenics and race. So, <clears throat> on October 16th, 1916, Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in the U.S. An advocate for women's reproductive rights who was also a vocal eugenicist, uh, eugenics enthusiast, Margaret Sanger lives, leaves a complicated legacy and one that conservatives have periodically leveraged into sweeping attacks on the organization she helped found, Planned Parenthood. Last year, 25 House Republicans campaigned to have a bust of the pioneering family planner removed from the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, where it has been included in an exhibit featuring American civil rights leaders called The Struggle for Justice, with Ted Cruz's office issuing a press release explaining that she didn't belong there for a number of reasons, the most damning of which is that as part of her inhumane life's work, she advocated for the extermination of African Americans. It's not the first time Singer has faced this accusation. During this past primary season, Ben Carson proclaimed that Singer believed that people like me should be eliminated, later clarifying per PolitiFact that he was talking about the black race, and in 2011, Herman Cain alleged that Singer's original goal for Planned Parenthood was to help kill black babies before they came into the world. So, I don't think that she necessarily agreed with aborting all children, just black children. That was her goal. Historians and scholars who've examined Singer's correspondence, as Salon reported in 2011, challenge those who call the activist racist. <clears throat> Much of the controversy stems from a 1939 letter in which Sanger outlined her plan to reach out to black leaders, specifically ministers, to help dispel community suspicions about the family planning clinics she was opening in the South. Um, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea of it if it occurs to any of their more rebellious members. It was, as the Washington Post called it, an, an artfully written sentence, but one that in context describes the sort of preposterous allegations she feared, not her actual mission. The irony is that it has been used to propagate those very allegations. Cruz's letter to the director of the National Portrait Gallery, for example, quotes only the first half of the sentence. <clears throat> Sanger's stated mission was to empower women to make their own reproductive choices. She did focus her efforts on minority communities because that was where, due to poverty and limited access to health care, women were especially vulnerable to the effects of unplanned pregnancy, as she framed it. Birth control was a fundamental women's rights issue. Enforced motherhood, she wrote in 1914, is the most complete denial of a woman's right to life and liberty. Okay. So I see where this article is going, that it's going to debunk all of the history that we know about Margaret Sanger, and that she didn't really believe all of these things, and it's just, she's being demonized because of what she did believe. Okay, here are 21 quotes by Margaret Sanger, okay? But from my view, I believe that there should be no more babies. She doesn't think there should be any more babies. The fact that she believed in what she believed, she also believed in population control, and she believed that we should reduce the population from what it already was at the time. 
I think 500 million is the population that they think is most sustainable to the world. Number two, the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. This is from Woman and the New Race, Chapter 5, The Wickedness of Creating Large Families, which I don't think it is wicked to create a large family if you can sustain that large family on your own hard work. If you have a family and it's you and your wife and you have 9, 10 kids, which back in the day they did. My my dad has um, six brothers and sisters. There were seven of them. There would have been eight, but my grandmother miscarried. So seven kids. But my papa, he worked and he worked more than one job. And he took care of all of his family all on his own with no extra help. And there's nothing wrong with that if you can do it on your own. Now, don't go to start having kids that you can't take care of and and provide a, a nice living for them or a decent living for them and that you have to suck off the government to be able to do it. But if you want 12, 13 kids and your job and your money can provide them a home and good food and pay for them to have clothes and things like that, that's your business, and it's not the government's business, because you only have kids because God allowed you to have kids, and you'll have as many as God would want you to have or not have. That's the way I look at it. <clears throat> People need to mind their own business. Number three, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, which is the letter that we were just reading about, but that can also be looked at the same way as look we don't want this word to get around yeah I understand that's what we're doing but we don't want it to go around and people know that's what we're doing number four I accepted an invitation to talk to the woman's branch of the Ku Klux Klan I was escorted to the platform was introduced and began to speak in the end through simple illustrations I believed I had accomplished my purpose a dozen invitations to speak to similar groups were proffered I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just marked when they're born. That to me is the greatest sin that people can commit. I mean, what a wicked person. But who is she to decide that? And just because a child is born to maybe someone who's a criminal doesn't necessarily mean that child's going to grow up to be a criminal. You can rise above your situation and your environment that you're born into. The most serious evil of our times is that of encouraging the bringing into the world of large families. The most immoral practice of the day is breeding too many children. Number seven, eugenics without birth control seems to use a house build it upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit. Number eight, as an advocate of birth control, I wish to take advantage of the present opportunity to point out that the unbalance between the birth rate of the unfit and the fit, admittedly the greatest present menace to civilization, can never be rectified by the inauguration of a cradle competition between these two classes. Number nine, the most urgent problem today is how to limit and discourage the overfertility of the mentally and physically defective. Number 10, no more children should be born when the parents, though healthy themselves, find that their children are physically or mentally defective. So you have one handicapped child you shouldn't be able to have any more. Just evil people. 11, a marriage license shall in itself give husband and wife only the right to a common household and not the right to parenthood. Number 12, no woman shall have the legal right to bear a child, and no man shall have the right to become a father without a permit for parenthood. These are literally people trying to play God, deciding who can and who cannot have children. It really it is disgusting. 13. Permits for parenthood shall be issued upon application by city, county, or state authorities to married couples, providing they are financially able to support the expected child, have the qualifications needed for proper rearing of the child, have no transmissible diseases, and on the woman's part, no medical indication that maternity is likely to result in death or permanent injury to health. Let me, let me just say this. 
Do I think there are some people that have children that probably shouldn't? Absolutely. I see a lot of dumb parents that have children and you wonder like, why are they reproducing? This is going to destroy society. But just to think that someone shouldn't have kids versus I'm going to tell you that you can't because I think you can't. Like, I'm not telling people they don't have a right to have children just because I don't think that they are fit parents. I that's I have a right to think they're not fit. And I don't mean fit as in, like, their ethnicity or their race. I mean the fact that they are so dumb that they don't watch their kids. They let their kids do whatever they want. They implement no rules for their children. Their child is the one that's bossing them around. Those are the kind of people that I'm like, please don't have any more children. Because you are raising up these jerks of society, these spoiled little brats of society. But I'm not telling them they can't because I think that. I have a right to think what I want, but they seem to think they have a right to dictate it. Number 14, no permit for parenthood shall be valid for more than one birth. 15, apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. 16. These two words, birth control, sum up our whole philosophy. It means the release and cultivation of the better elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. 17. Organized charity itself is the symptom of a malignant social disease. 18. My own position is that the Catholic doctrine is illogical, not in accord with science, and definitely against social welfare and race improvement. 19. All our problems are the result of overbreeding among the working class. Knowledge of birth control is essentially moral. Its general, though prudent practice, must lead to a higher individuality and ultimately to a cleaner race. 20. Feeble-mindedness perpetuates itself from the ranks of those who are blandly indifferent to their racial responsibilities, and it is largely this type of humanity we are now drawing upon to populate our world for the generations to come. In this orgy of multiplying and replenishing the earth, this type is pari passu, passu? I don't know what that means, multiplying and perpetuating those direst evils in which we must, if civilization is to survive, extirpate by the very roots. I don't know what this means, so I'm going to look it up. Come on. Um, it's a Latin phrase that literally means with an equal step or unequal footing. Okay. 21. Birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectives, or of those who will become defectives. If we are to make racial progress, this development of womanhood must precede motherhood in every individual woman. That's only 21. Oh, 22 and 23 are actually... um, Recordings of what she said. Are they really long, though? And now to our... Oh. This is Margaret Slee, president of America's Planned Parenthood Federation, maintains that European women should stop having babies for the next 10 years. Don't you think such a theory, such a radical theory, is antisocial? On the contrary. It seems to me that it is more practical and humane. What about the women who want babies now and in 10 years will not be able to have babies? Rather impractical, don't you think? Oh, John, you do ask hard questions. I should think that instead of being impractical, it is really very practical and intelligent and humane. But, Mrs. Slee, in this country, having babies is the only thing left which is both unrationed and untaxed. Do you think we really ought to stop? Well, I suppose a subject like that is really so personal that it's entirely up to the parents to decide. But for my view, I believe that there should be no more babies. This is my... No more babies. And, I mean, and who is she? She's not, like, some wonderful-looking woman. I mean, talk about, like, defective, and she thinks she's so superior. I don't see any superiority about this woman at all. 
Now, I know she doesn't necessarily mean, like, physical looks, but still. Ew. I think that's why people like this are so miserable. You, if you'll notice, a lot of the people on the left, they're, um, especially women, they are, I don't know how else you can say it, but they're so ugly on the inside that it translates to the outside, but I think the reason their outside is so ugly is because of what's on the inside. I, I, it's, it's like, I don't know how it spills out into their physical appearance, but you can just look at a woman and know what her ideologies are most of the time. And if they have, like, bright colored hair, they wear these Coke bottle glasses and really weird clothes and their haircuts are, are funky, you probably know that they're a liberal leftist, probably a radical leftist as, at that, and they're probably very hateful people too because they're so miserable. And I've noticed one thing about conservative women, they're always well put together, their hair is always nicely done, they wear a little bit of makeup, not not a whole lot to completely change their looks. They, they always are mostly modestly dressed. Um, some women would have a different idea of what modestly dressed is as a, compared to what I believe is more modestly dressed. But you can see a difference. And I think it's the difference is because of whether you're miserable in life or you're happy. And a lot of leftists are just miserable, angry, depressed people. And it spills out to the outside into their physical appearance. Now... Um, we've kind of discussed Margaret Sanger and who she is and kind of how all of this got started. Um, there's a lot more to her than just the birth control. And that is actually a very sad story. Um, but there's other things that she did besides the birth control and where she did the testing for that. Um, the Negro Project, this is from Women for America. Uh, or concernedwomen.org. So it was called the Negro Project, and it was Margaret Sanger's eugenic plan for black Americans. And um, this was a real thing, okay? So um, Margaret Sanger aligned herself with the eugenicists whose ideology prevailed in the early 20th century. Eugenicists strongly espoused racial supremacy and purity, particularly of the Aryan race. Eugenicists hoped to purify the bloodlines and improve the race by encouraging the fit to reproduce and the unfit to restrict their reproduction. They sought to contain the inferior races through segregation, sterilization, birth control, and abortion. Sanger embraced uh, Malthusian eugenics, Thomas Robert uh, Malthus, I guess that's how you say it, a 19th century cleric and professor of political economy believed a population time bomb threatened the existence of the human race. He viewed social problems such as poverty, deprivation, and hunger as evidence of this population crisis. According to writer George Grant, Malthus condemned charities and other forms of benevolence because he believed they only exacerbated the problems. His answer was to restrict the population growth of certain groups of people. His theories of population growth and economic stability became the basis for national and international social policy. Grant quotes from Malthus's magnum opus, an essay on the principle of population, published in six editions from 1798 to 1826. It says all children born beyond what would be required to keep up the population to a desired level must necessarily perish unless room is made for them by the deaths of grown persons. We should facilitate instead of foolishly and vainly endeavoring to impede the operations of nature in producing this mortality. Malthus's disciples believed if Western civilization, civilization were to survive, the physically unfit, the materially poor, the spiritually dise diseased, the racially inferior, and the mentally incompetent had to be suppressed and isolated or even perhaps eliminated. His disciples felt the subtler and more scientific approaches of education. Contraception, sterilization, and abortion were more practical and acceptable ways to ease the pressures of the alleged overpopulation. 
Critics of Methusianism said the group produced a new vocabulary of mumbo-jumbo. It was all hard-headed, scientific, and relentless. Further historical facts have proved that Malthusian mathematical scheme regarding overpopulation to be inaccurate, though many still believe them. Despite the falsehood, falsehoods of Malthus' overpopulation claims, Sanger nonetheless immersed herself in Malthusian eugenics. Grant wrote she argued for birth control using the scientifically verified threat of poverty, sickness, racial tension, and overpopulation as its background. Sanger's publication, The Birth Control Review, founded in 1917, regularly published pro-eugenic articles from eugenicists such as Ernest Rudin. Although Sanger ceased editing the Birth Control Review in 1929, the ABCL continued to use it as a platform for eugenic ideas. So the ABCL becomes a legal entity, it became a legal entity on April 22, 1922 in New York. Before that, Sanger illegally operated a birth control clinic in October 1916 in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, New York, which eventually closed. The clinic serviced the poor immigrants who heavily populated the area those deemed unfit to reproduce. Sanger's early writings uh, uh, clarify reflected, clearly reflected Methuselah's influence. She writes, organized charity itself is a symptom of a malignant social disease. Those vast, complex, interrelated organizations aiming to control and to diminish the spread of misery and destitution and all the menacing evils that spring out of the sinisterly fertile soil are the uh, surest sign that our civilization has bred, is breeding, and perpetuating constantly increasing numbers of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. Um, she also said... Uh, Charity encourages the healthier and more normal sections of the world to shoulder the burden of unthinking and indiscriminate, uh, facu how do you say that? Fecundity? Fecundity? I don't even know. Of others. Once again, another word that I don't understand, which is, I hate that. Like I said, I'm not college educated, so some vocabulary words I just don't know. Um, it's defined in two ways. Human... Demography, it is the potential for reproduction. Okay. Okay. Nah, sure. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but okay. Uh, which brings with it, as I think the reader must agree, a dead weight of human waste. Instead of decreasing and aiming to eliminate the stocks that are most detrimental to the future of the race and the world, it tends to render them to a menacing degree dominant, emphasis added. She concluded, the most serious charge that can be brought against modern benevolence is that it encourages the perpetuation of defectives, delinquents, and dependents. These are the most dangerous elements in the world community, the most devastating curse on human progress and expression. The review printed an excerpt of an address Sanger gave in 1926, which said, It now remains for the U.S. government to set a sensible example to the world by offering a bonus or yearly pension to all obviously unfit parents who allow themselves to be sterilized by harmless and scientific means. In this way, the moron and the disease would have no posterity to inherit their unhappy condition. The number of the feeble-minded would decrease and a heavy burden would be lifted from the shoulders of the fit. So, in her birth control clinics, um, she should establish uh, in which men and women will be taught the science of parenthood and the science of breeding, for this was a way to breed out, the, out of the race the scourges of transmissible disease, mental defect, poverty, lawlessness, crime, since these classes would be decreasing in number instead of breeding like weeds. Emphasis added, okay. So, um, it, this was... Um, an essay entitled, We Must Breed a Race of Thoroughbreds. Her program called for women to receive birth control advice in various situations, including where the woman or man had a transmissible disease, such as insanity, feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, syphilis, etc. The children already born were subnormal or feeble-minded. The father's wages were inadequate to provide for more children. Sanger said such a plan would reduce the birth rate among the diseased, the sickly, the poverty-stricken, and antisocial classes, elements unable to provide for themselves, and the burden of which we are all forced to carry. Um, the Harlem Clinic in 1929, 10 years before Singer created the Negro Project, 
The ABCLA laid the groundwork for a clinic in Harlem, a largely black section of New York City. It was the dawn of the Great Depression, and for blacks, that meant double the misery. Blacks faced harsher conditions of desperation and privation because of widespread racial prejudice and discrimination. So, the clinic officially opened November 21, 1930, and many blacks looked to escape their adverse circumstances and therefore did not recognize the eugenic undercurrent of the clinic. The clinic relied on the generosity of private foundations to remain in business. So, they were segregated in an overpopulated area. Um, 224,760 of 330,000 of Greater New York Blacks population lived in Harlem during the 20s and 30s. They comprised 12% of New York City's population, but accounted for 18.4% of New York City's unemployment, had an infant mortality rate of 101 per 1,000 births compared to 56 among whites, and had a death rate from tuberculosis, 237 per 100,000 that was highest in central Harlem out of all of New York City. Although the clinic served whites as well as blacks, it was established for the benefit of the colored people. Um, a sociologist and author, he helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909 to improve the living conditions of black Americans. She wrote, this, she wrote a letter to Dr. W.E. Burgart Dubois. And he's an, that's who that was. So, um, Grace Congregational Church hosted a debate on birth control. Um, and eventually the Urban League took control of the clinic and indication the black community had become ensnared in Sanger's labyrinth. So they used birth control as a solution. And, um, it says some viewed birth control as a viable solution. High reproduction, they believed, meant prolonged poverty and degradation. Desperate for change, others began to accept the rationale of birth control. A few embraced eugenics. The June 1932 edition of the Birth Control Review, called The Negro Number, featured a series of articles written by blacks on the virtues of birth control. Um, Dubois wrote one called Black Folk and Birth Control. Charles S. Johnson, Fisk University's first black president, Quote, wrote, eugenic discrimination was unnecessary for blacks. Um, further, the status of Negroes as marginal workers, their confinement to the lowest paid branches of industry, the necessity for the labors of mothers, as well as children to balance meager budgets, are factors that emphasize the need for lessening the burden, not only for themselves, but of society, which must provide the supplementary support in the form of relief. Um... Writer Walter A. Tarpening described bringing a black child into a hostile world as pathetic. Um, in his article, God's Chillin', he wrote, uh, and chillin', I mean like children, but chillin'. The birth of a colored child, even to parents who can give it adequate support, is pathetic in view of the unchristian and undemocratic treatment likely to be accorded, at the, accorded it at the hands of a predominantly white community, and the denial of choice and propagation to this unfortunate class is nothing less than barbarous, barbarous however you want to say it. So then there's the web of deceit. So... Let me take off my, my sweater. I'm hot. Okay, so prior to 1939, Sanger's outreach to the black community was largely limited to her Harlem Clinic and speaking at black churches. But then it she expanded her vision after the January 1939 merger of the Clinical Research Bureau and the American Birth Control League to form the Birth Control Federation of America. She selected Dr. Clarence J. Gamble of the soap manufacturing company Procter & Gamble to be the BCFA Regional Director of the South. And I will tell you, Gamble plays a large role in the birth control uh it, with what it is, the, the history of it, it's actually very disgusting. So, I'm just kind of skimming through this so I can get to um, what exactly the Negro Project was. 
Um, I do think that this article actually will, will tell us. Um, there's another one called Black Genocide from blackgenocide.org. And I don't know if it goes exactly all the way into um, what it is. Uh, there's five pages, so it's huge. I'm not going to read about Gamble yet because I want to save that for, um, I want to save that for when we start talking about the, um, birth control. Okay, well, I can't find it. This is another one. I wonder if this is going to cover about. It's not. So let me see if I can pull up something real quick. And I'll just tell you exactly what it was. I'll go right here, pull this up. It's 16 pages. The Negro Project, Mar Margaret Sanger's eugenic plan for black Americans. Um, so it covers the Malthusian eugenics which we've already talked about. And that just kind of just all the stuff. There's the Harlem Clinic, birth control as a solution, web of seats, better health for 113,000, scientific racism. Okay, so I guess this basically is what I'm talking about is the Negro Project with the birth control and, you know, lying to all the black people, the Harlem Clinic, all that. That actually is the whole thing. It's not any one specific thing. It's the whole thing. All of that that we were just now talking about is the um, uh, Negro Project. So we were talking about the Web of Deceit. And I'm not going to talk about the better health for, for 13 uh, million, is that what it is? But it says that the propaganda of the Negro Project was that birth control meant better health. So on this premise, the BCFA designed two Southern Negro Project demonstration programs to show how medically supervised birth control integrated into existing public health services could improve the general welfare of Negroes and to initiate a nationwide educational program. The BCFA opened the first clinic at the Bethlehem Center in urban Nashville, Tennessee, where blacks constituted only 25% of the population on February 13, 1940. And then um, they extended the work to the Social Services Center of Fisk University on July 23, 1940. Then they opened a clinic on May 1, 1940 in rural Berkeley County, South Carolina, under the supervision of Dr. Robert E. Seibels, Chairman of the Committee on Maternal Welfare of the South Carolina Medical Association. So there's that. Um, a hint of eugenic flavor season um, a speech of Dr. Dorothy Farabee. A future program of Planned Parenthood should center around more education in the field through the work of a professional Negro worker because those of us who believe that the benefits of Planned Parenthood as a vital key to the elimination of human waste must reach the entire population. There you go. Wonderful people, aren't they? So Planned Parenthood has gone to great lengths to repudiate the despite evidence to the contrary. Because Sanger stopped editing the birth control review in 1929, the organization tries to disassociate her from the eugenic and racist-oriented articles published after that date. However, a summary of an address Sanger gave in 1932, which appeared in the review that year, revealed her continuing bent toward eugenics. In A Plan for Peace, Sanger suggested Congress set up a special department to study population problems and appoint a Parliament of Population. One of the main objectives of the Population Congress would be to 
raise the level and increase the general intelligence of population. This would be accomplished by applying a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation in addition to tightening immigration laws to that grade of population whose progeny is already tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. Um, so then you have uh, yeah, people that defend Sanger, obviously. Right. It says that Grant presents other arguments Singer supporters use to refute her racist roots. Black, Jews, Hispanics, and other minorities are well represented in the upper echelons of Planned Parenthood Federation of America because they're duped. The former high profile president of the organization, Faye Waddleton, is a black woman. Aggressive minority hiring practices have been standard procedure for more than two decades, and the vast majority of the nation's ethnic leadership solidly and actively supports the work of the organization. But these justifications also fail because of what Grant calls scientific racism. This form of racism is based on genes rather than skin color or language. The issue is not color of skin or dialect of tongue, Grant writes, but quality of genes. Therefore, as long as blacks, Jews, and Hispanics demonstrate a good quality gene pool, as long as they act white and think white, then they are esteemed equally with Aryans. As long as they are, as Margaret Sanger said, the best of their race, then they can be counted as valuable citizens. So, there you go. Um, by the same token, individual whites who show uh, dysgenic traits must also have their fertility curbed right along with the other inferiors and undesirables. In short, writes Grant, scientific racism is an equal opportunity discriminator. Anyone with a defective gene pool is suspect, and anyone who shows promise may be admitted to the ranks of the elite. So her legacy is of lies and propaganda, and it continues to infiltrate the black community. The poison is even more venomous because in addition to birth control, Planned Parenthood touts abortion as a solution to the economic and social problems that plague the community. In its wake is the loss of more than 12 million lives within the black community alone. Planned Parenthood's own records reflect this. For example, a 1992 report revealed that 23.2% of women who obtained abortions at at its affiliates were black, although blacks represent no more than 13% of the total population. In 1996, Planned Parenthood's research arm reported blacks who make up 14% of all child childbearing women had 31% of all abortions, and whites who account for 81% of women of childbearing age have 61%. Abortion is the number one killer of blacks in America, says Reverend Hunter of Learn. We're losing our people at the rate of 1,452 a day. That's just pure genocide. There's no other word for it. Singer's influence and the whole mindset that Planned Parenthood has brought into the black community say it's okay to destroy your people. We bought into the lie. We bought into the propaganda. Some blacks have even made abortion rights synonymous with civil rights. We're destroying the destiny and purpose of others who should be here, Hunter laments. Who knows the musicians we've lost? Who knows the great leaders the black community has really lost? Who knows what great minds of economic power people have lost? What great teachers? He recites an old African proverb. No one knows whose womb holds the chief. He said, when I traveled around the country, I can only think of one abortion clinic I've seen in a predominantly white neighborhood. The majority of clinics are in black neighborhoods. Hunter noted the controversy that occurred two years ago in Louisiana involving a school-based health clinics. The racist undertones could not have been more evident. In the Baton Rouge district, officials were debating placing clinics in the high schools. Black state representative Sharon Weston Broom initially supported the idea. She later expressed concern about clinics providing contraceptives and abortion counseling. Clinics should promote abstinence, she said. Upon learning officials wanted to put the clinics in black schools only, Hunter urged her to suggest they be placed in white schools as well. At Broom's suggestion, however, proposals for the school clinics were dropped immediately. Grant observed the same game plan 20 years ago. 
During the 1980s, when Planned Parenthood shifted its focus from community-based clinics to school-based clinics, it again targeted inner-city minority neighborhoods. Of the more than 100 school-based clinics that have opened nationwide in the last decade, none has been at substantially all-white schools. None has been at suburban middle-class schools. All have been at black, minority, or ethnic schools. In 1987, a group of black ministers, parents, and educators filed suit against the Chicago Board of Education. They charged the city school-based clinics with not only violating the state's fornication laws, but also with discrimination against blacks. The clinics were a calculated, pernicious effort to destroy the very fabric of family life between black parents and their children, the suit alleged. <clears throat> One of the parents in the group was shocked when her daughter came home from school with Planned Parenthood material. I never realized how racist those people were until I read the information my daughter received at the school clinic. They are worse than the Klan because they're so slick and sophisticated. Their bigotry is all dolled up with statistics and surveys, but just beneath the surface, it's as ugly as apartheid. A more recent account uncovered a Planned Parenthood affiliate giving condoms to residents of a poor black neighborhood in Akron, Ohio. The residents received a promotional bag containing, among other things, literature on sexually transmitted disease prevention, gynecology exams and contraception, a condom case keychain containing a bright green condom, and a coupon. The coupon was redeemable at three Ohio County clinics for a dozen condoms and a $5 McDonald's gift certificate. All the items were printed with Planned Parenthood phone numbers. The affiliate might say they're t targeting high pregnancy areas, but their response presumes destructive behavior on the part of the targeted group. Planned Parenthood has always been reluctant to promote or encourage abstinence as the only safeguard against teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases, calling it unrealistic. Um, it's not. It's not unrealistic. Truly, it's not. So, black leaders have been silent about Margaret Sanger's evil machina machination against their community far too long. They've been silent about abortion, devastating effects in their community, despite their pro-life inclination. The majority of blacks are more pro-life than anything else. Blacks were never taught to destroy their children. Even in slavery, slavery, they tried to hold on to their children. Blacks are not quiet about the issue because they do not care, but rather because the truth has been kept from them. The issue is to educate our people... Um, said former Planned Parenthood board member Laverne Tolbert. Today, a growing number of black pro-lifers are untangling the deceptive web spun by Sanger. They are using truth to shed light on the lies. The Say So March is just one example of their burgeoning pro-life activism. As the marchers laid 1,452 roses at the courthouse steps to commemorate the number of black babies aborted daily, spokesman Damon Owen said, this calls national attention to the problem of abortion. This is an opportunity for blacks to speak to other blacks. This doesn't solve all our problems but we will not solve all our problems with abortion. Black pro-lifers are also linking arms with their white, white pro-life brethren. Black Americans for Life is an outreach program of the National Right to Life Committee, a Washington, D.C.-based grassroots organization. NRLC encourages network, networking between black and white pro-lifers. Our goal is to bring people together from all races, colors, and religions to work on pro-life issues. Um, that's the director of outreach, Ernest Olaf, for NRLC. Black Americans for Life is not a parallel group. We want to help African Americans integrate communicational and functionally into the pro-life movement. <clears throat> Ms. Beverly LaHaye, founder and chairman of Concerned Women for America, echoes the sentiment. Our mission is to protect the right to life of all members of the human race. CWA welcomes like-minded women and men from all walks of life to join us in this fight. Concerned Women for America has a long history of fighting Planned Parenthood's evil agenda. The Negro Project is an obscure angle, but one that must come to light. Margaret Sanger sold black Americans an illusion. Now, with the veil of deception removed, they can choose life that their descendants may live. It's irritating because I have a black daughter and to think that people that are so evil out there to lie to someone and, and try to to confuse them and, and blind them to what they're really doing under the guise of helping them out. And they, and it's sadly a lot, a lot of people fell for it. And white people too, it's not just black people, all people have fallen for this disguise that Planned Parenthood has put on. And 
it's just, it's disgusting and it's irritating that so many people are just so willing to just throw their babies' lives away like that. Like, they're just not important. And I feel like definitely this is something that needs to be ousted and people need to know really why this was started, what was really behind it. it it's not charity. It's not out of the goodness of their heart to lift people up out of poverty. It's because they hate certain types of people. And like you heard it, it's not because they're black. It's because they think they're unfit. They're dumb. They have a mental illness or maybe a physical handicap. And that goes for anybody, any ethnicity. They didn't like people like that. If you're a little slow, whatever it is, they don't want you here and they don't want you bringing children into the world to end up being like you. They're evil, wicked, murderous people. And on Thursday, we're going to cover, we're, we'll get into the whole birth control thing and the history of it, where it got started, what Margaret Sanger and Gamble did, who they used it on to test it on, and the lives that they destroyed by doing so. We'll, we'll discuss that on Thursday. So I hope you um, enjoy learning about this today. I hope you left with something new that you never knew before. And take this and go and share it. You can join my Facebook, Lauren Collins. I just got to say something. You can email me, got to say something, 21 at gmail.com. My subreddit is r slash just got to say something. And you can find me on Anchor, Spotify, Pandora, Google, wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Go subscribe to mine. Leave me a review if you'd like. And then if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like and share this video with everybody that you know. Don't forget, I'm blocked off Facebook, so I need help promoting this week. Thank you. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so you know every time I upload a new video. And as always, go and subscribe to The Scott Ford Show. Isaac Hayes, the Cajun Conservative, and his Christian podcast, Brothers Just Searching, Nate Savage at Savage5050, and TV's Rob is Unwoke. Thank you for joining me today. Hope to see you back here tomorrow. Have a great day. God bless.